Father God in heaven, uh, how grateful we are to you, Lord, for, for being our Lord and being our God, creating us, giving us, giving us breath uh, in our lungs and uh, brains to think with and jobs and families and just all the blessings of this daily life. Uh, but even more than all that, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word um, through which we can know him and know you, understand your spirit. We pray, Father, that as we study your word tonight, uh, that you would teach us by your spirit, that you would reveal truth to us. Give us uh, discerning years, Lord, to uh, be able to separate truth from why and may we always cherish in our hearts your truth. Uh, always be willing to give up what we think. Um, always be uh, teachable in our spirit. So that we might come to a, a, a more full knowledge of you. Pray for Jeffrey with his headache tonight, Lord. Um, pray that you would ease that tension and give him relief. Um, whatever's causing it, Father, I pray that you would massage it away in your mercy. I pray for those who can't join us uh, tonight, that hopefully they'll get an opportunity to maybe listen to uh, the study online later. But wherever they are and whatever's going on with them, we pray your blessings rest upon them to meet their needs, protect and provide for them, Lord. Um, we commit the time to you. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 7. We're starting at verse 3. Unfortunately, the last couple of studies, we only got through one verse, but we did do an excursus or two along the way. I think we spent some time on, on, on tithing versus the concept of grace giving or heart giving. Um, and so we're back on track tonight, verse, uh, verse one and two we've covered. We'll go back and read through those, but we'll pick up our study in three. In fact, I think I'd like to read probably up through, oh, I don't know. Oh, let's read through verse seven, one through seven. So here we go. Hebrews. 7, 1 through 7, and then we'll begin our study in verse 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choices of spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi, who received the priest's office, have commandment in the law to collect the tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren. Although these are descended from Abraham, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Now, we could go a little farther. Um, but there's enough to cover already. So let's just go back now to verse 3. And as we always do, sort of work our way through the text. So verse 3 says, and it's about this guy Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without genealogy, 
Now, without father and without mother would be fine on its own if we were talking about a man, just an ordinary human being. But the writer adds the phrase without genealogy. So neither did he have mother or father. He, he didn't even have anybody from whom he descended. In fact, this word, this word, and, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see this. This word. Without genealogy, uh, it's number 35 in the strong. Here's the word. You can say that. Good luck to you. Ag-n-e-a-lag-etos. Okay, whatever that is. This is a made-up word. This word does not appear anywhere else in the Bible, and, and for a good reason. You'll see that there's, this, there's one incidence of it, that's it. And it means without descent, didn't descend from anybody. That word does not exist uh, anywhere else or appear anywhere else in the Bible because of the concept is nonsensical for uh, anyone who would have read the Bible back in that day because everybody has a genealogy. There would, there would be no reason to have a word that that describes a person who doesn't have a genealogy because there's no such thing. But in the case of Melchizedek, it was the case. And so a word had to be coined in Hebrew in order to make that statement. So now, just think about this. It says, without father, without mother, without genealogy. As I said, it could have just, it could have just said, well, without father and without mother. Okay, so maybe they died, or he was an orphan, and nobody knows who they are. The writer goes one step further and says, no genealogy. In fact, invents a word that does not exist in Hebrew to describe the <clears throat> lack of parentage of this person, Melchizedek. I think that is another argument for in favor of this being a Christological manifestation, what we call a Christophany, where the pre-incarnate, the before he was born Christ, appeared as he did in the burning bush. He was the voice of the burning bush uh, when Moses was first called to deliver the Hebrews from bondage in Egypt. But this is yet one more Christophany. Uh, a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament prior to his coming to the earth as a man, as a human being. Without father, without mother, without genealogy. Now, I've, I've talked about the scholars. Sorry about that. Uh, I've talked about scholars who argue that this is just typology. In other words, that, you know, Melchizedek was a real person. Uh, and, 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 you know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't I want to be arrogant about the view I'm presenting. Uh, you know, I could be wrong. Uh, but it just seems that as you scrutinize the text, it, to me, it seems that it becomes more and more obvious that we're talking about a real person here. Uh, excuse me, that uh, we're not talking about a mere person here, but we're talking about a Christophany. This is, this is the, the pre-incarnate Christ showing up on the scene uh, to receive this tithe from Abraham. And scholars, scholars who don't go the Christophany route, but rather go the typology route, that, that, that Melchizedek was a surreal guy, and he happened to you know, live a certain way and do a few things, and, and so we can use, his, use his, him as a type of Christ. We'll call them the typologists. Uh, the people in that camp, they suggest that the phrase simply means that nobody knew who his parents were. Well, I would, I would, I would go that route more easily, more willingly, 
if it weren't for the additional phrase or the additional word that's coined here, which I could not pronounce, it's translated without genealogy. Not only is he without father, without mother, he is without genealogy. There is no parentage. He has no pedigree. Um, it, it, it seems a stretch with that additional phrase of without genealogy uh, to just uh, accept this as a typological representation by, by an ordinary human being. Uh, the text says that Melchizedek is without parents. He's, the context of the description of this passage is of an eternal being. Because uh, it, it goes on, he's going to, in a minute, he's going to say, neither beginning of days nor end of life, like the Son of God, a priest perpetually. Um, you know, those are, that, that's significant context. So we, we want to make sure that we're always uh, drawing from the text what's there. That's called exegesis, ex exit going out, taking something out of the text, that's what you want to do, uh, versus eisegesis, which is reading into the text or putting into the text your own viewpoints, your own, you know, your own ideas or the things that you want to say, forcing them on the text. I think if you just take the exegetical approach to the text, the context really does not allow for this being a typological uh, representation by an ordinary human, but rather it's a Christophany. Um, if, if he was just an orphan, it would have been much easier to describe his background by just saying he was an orphan. But that word isn't used here. It, it's, it, it's the other word that we can't pronounce, which is without genealogy. Uh, that, that's the word that gets that, that gets used. The word orphan uh, and its very, uh, various, or excuse me, variations appear all throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New. Uh, so it's, it's not like, you know, the, the writer couldn't have used that word. There, there are several words for orphan in scripture, but that isn't the word that's used. It's not that we didn't know whose parents were. He didn't have any. It isn't that they couldn't be found or that they were gone or out of the picture. He wasn't an orphan. He was, the writer can simply have said that. Uh, the, next, the next passage, or excuse me, the next uh, phrase is having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Uh, again, these same, these same type, typologists, if you will, these same scholars um, say that no, nobody knew when he was born or when he died. But, but that's not what the text says. The text doesn't say his, his birth and his death were unknown or not recorded. Uh, it says he didn't have any. He didn't have a beginning of days. He did not have an end of life. He did not begin, and he does not end. Uh You know, God, God's omnipotent, uh, and his word is, you know, inspired. It's God-breathed, this text that we're studying this evening. You know, if, if, if there was a date of birth or a date of death, God could have easily inspired uh, the writer of Hebrews with that information, if that information uh, was available. But not only is that information not included, his date of birth or date of death or, or any information about it, but there's the declaration that he had neither. And to me, that just seems pretty straightforward. And to try to make it mean something else seems, seems more than a you know, trivial stretch, I think. Um, you know, we you know, think about this. We see some controversy with liberal scholars over the meaning of the word day in the creation accounts. Um, you know, it, it is possible that God meant something else other than day when he used day and morning and evening and one day and morning and evening 
a second day and morning and evening and third day and so on. Um, but God goes out of his way uh, to lead us to the belief that he meant a 24-hour period. Irrespective of what he did mean, he goes out of his way to make us believe that he meant a 24-hour day. Uh, it, for example, in, in Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Um, you have references up by uh, Jesus in the New Testament regarding the same point. And, and what I'm getting at is, 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 is scholars say, yeah, but the yeah, but day meant something else. Well, it, it may have. But why would God go out of his way to make us think what he meant was 24 hours? You see my point? Wave at me. Okay. I <laughs> so actually like, got to use that one in my application the other day. What's that? I got to use that argument in my application the other right. day. Was, Very yeah. good. Well, my point is, is to carry that argument over here. Um, yes, he could have. he could have meant that he had a beginning of days and an end of life, but that nobody knew what they were. But he goes out of his way to not say that. He goes out of his way to say instead that he had neither beginning of days nor end of life. And I'm sure you see my point. If, if, if God wanted us to believe one thing, why would he go out of his way to get us to believe something else? I don't think he did. I think he meant what he said. I think he meant he didn't have a father, he didn't have a mother, he didn't have a genealogy, he wasn't born, and he didn't die. Just like the text says. I take God at his word. I don't have any reason to read anything else into it. I just take it as it is. Exegesis. The next phrase. It says, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. I think it's important to note where you put your comma here. You could read this, made like the Son of God. It says, but made like the Son of God, comma, he remains a priest perpetually. But it might be saying that he was made, comma, like the Son of God, comma, a priest perpetually. Or to continue as a priest perpetually. But whether you read it made like the Son of God, comma, or whether you put the comma ahead of it, um, the word made means caused to be. So this word like the Son of God, this phrase like the Son, as in like the Son of God, is reminiscent of the phrase like a Son of Man which was descriptive of the pre-incarnate Christ in Daniel chapter 7. So when God used that phrase, like a son of man, he was specifically in Daniel 7 referring to Jesus himself, the pre-incarnate Christ in Daniel 7, 13. I'll read it for you. Here's a verse. It'll be in your notes. I kept looking in the night visions, Daniel said, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And that, of course, scholars believe is, is uh, a reference to the Messiah, the Christ, the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Well, I would argue that that very same type of phrase, like a son, referenced yet again an image of a representation of or a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ prior to his incarnation. We have it again in Revelation 1.13 and Revelation 14.14. 14. I'll read those for you. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. Now listen to this. Like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And on it goes, and that's a reference to Jesus. And then in verse 14, we have another reference to Jesus. It says, then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Again, in Revelation and the reference to Jesus Christ, you see this phrase, like a son of man. 
like a son, like a son of man, like a son of God. My argument is that when that phraseology is used, it is used with reference to Jesus. I don't see any reason why in the Hebrews 7 verse 3 passage when it says, but made like the son of God, he remains a priest perpetually, that we have any reason to believe that the phrase means anything other than what it has meant consistently in the other places of scripture. That is, is that it is in fact the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ that is being referred to. And then finally, at the end of the uh, phrase, we've got, he remains a priest perpetually. So this means that, that he, not his priesthood, continues forever. Um, if, if Mel, and I want you to think about this with me for a second. If Melchizedek remains a priest forever, when does he move out of the way for Jesus to become our great high priest? Because the text there in verse 3 says, he, you know, if you, if you don't have your Bible in front of, me, in front of you, I'll share my screen with you again. Here it is. Like the Son of God, he remains, he remains, not his priesthood, but he remains a priest perpetually. So if, if Melchizedek remains a priest forever, when is he not a priest so that Jesus is the high priest? Because Jesus is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. It's Melchizedek's order. It's the Melchizedekian priesthood that Jesus is the high priest within. Uh, if Jesus is the high priest of, of the order of Melchizedek, when did Melchizedek step down if the text says that he remains a priest perpetually? Unless they're the same person, which is, of course, the argument that I'm making. I believe they are the same person. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, is, in fact, the king of righteousness and the king of peace. In fact, back in verse 2, um, it says, this person to whom Abraham gave the tenth was, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. That's not saying that his name was king of righteousness and that's the translation of the word Melchizedek, it says he was king of righteousness. He was, first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. This, this guy wasn't, wasn't a guy whose title was king of righteousness. This is the guy who was king of righteousness. And we, of course, we, we know that only Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, is king. The word for king there in the text is S-A-R in the Greek, sar which is the same uh, word that's uh, in other languages is czar, czar, T-S-A-R, C-Z-A-R, Caesar, Kaiser, all those forms of king, emperor, that's the word. So it, it seems to me that, especially with this verse three, no father, no mother, no genealogy, neither beginning of days or end of life, son of God remains a priest perpetually. I don't see how you can make that a person. I just have real trouble with that. I think this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, which, which, which does seem quite, quite, quite clear. So made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. He is the Son of God and thus remains a priest forever. I mean, we could take a break right there and just knock that around if anybody wants to. Yeah, I have a question, sure. or I had two, I hope I remember. The, um, is, uh, the first one is, is there, what would be the motivation, if any, for, think, for not considering uh, Melchizedek as being Jesus? I All mean, right. that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, just like in the in the secular, in the non-Christian world, Chelsea, you have people who are anti-supernaturalists. They have a predisposition that denies the existence of the supernatural world. Uh, it's very hard to convince those people there is, you know, there is a God that exists in the ethereal world uh, because they deny the existence of anything outside of the physical realm. So they have a bias. There are um, and, 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 and when it comes to theologians, we all have biases. Um, 
whether you're a young theologian and just getting your start or whether you've been studying scripture for 30 or 40 years and got all kinds of degrees and doctorates and who knows whatever else, we all have a bias when we come to the test text. It's hard not to do that. Our bias comes hopefully from our study and not just from our fears. But too often, I think, I think our biases come, come out of our fears. And I think it's important to, wherever you can, to let the text speak for itself. What does it say? What does it mean? And how do I apply it? That's, that's expositional teaching. That's, ex, that's exegesis. So to answer the question, how does it happen when it comes to theologians? I think there is a fear, Chelsea, that people will see Jesus behind every tree that uh, people will spiritualize uh, the texts of Scripture to the point of allegorizing it so that it doesn't mean what it says anymore. But, the, the, but I, I, this well-worn phrase I, or, or, or analogy that I like to use, is, you know, you, 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 you steer out a, away from one ditch and you oversteer into the other ditch. If you're not careful, you, you can try to avoid uh, these pitfalls so so vigilantly that you end up committing them. You, you, you end up spiritualizing the text and not taking it as it's, as it's plainly written down. So, so I think there are, there are uh, amongst God, and I'm not picking on them, you know, I have my biases too, um, but I think there are scholars and students of Scripture that have a bias uh, against, and, and let me just back up. There was a uh, probably the earliest scholar among the patriarch uh, among the patristics that we know. I'm talking about the first couple of centuries uh, after the cross. Um, you've got guys like Tertullian and uh, uh, before Augustine, who was in the fourth century. There's another guy named Origen, O R I G E N, Origen, and Origen was really big on finding Christ. In every, you know, I'm exaggerating, but every word of the Old Testament was Jesus. You know, if you ask him in Sunday school, what, what's this passage in the Old Testament? Uh, Jesus, you know, he saw Jesus, it seems, everywhere. Well, I've read some of Origen's writings, and I, I have trouble disagreeing with a lot of things that he wrote. Uh, I, I think he does allegorize a bit too much, and everything's about Jesus, when, when sometimes there are other lessons with the text that I think God's trying to show us. Or he's trying to give us a a history, a history of some things that happened that aren't necessarily uh, prescriptive or predictive or prophetic or 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 typological representations of, of Christ, and maybe they are, uh, but he has his critics and he has his critics among scholars. Origin does, and so I think there is a fear, there's a worry that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna misinterpret the text. We're gonna we give too much license to people who want to see Christ in every in every verse of the Old Testament, and so we're gonna we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna be against it. Unless the text says this is Jesus, then we're not gonna go for it. So I, that's the answer. I think uh, I I think that I'm being fair to the other the other side in this debate. Yeah, that makes sense. And did did uh, one the other part or the other? Yeah, I had another question and. It was, um, I was into your answer on that one and forgot to think about what my other question was. All right, well, if it comes back up, just blurt it out. Okay. Let's ask for whatever. Uh, anybody else want to kick in on that? Verse three. One more time. Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but like made like the son of man, he remains a piece of I remember my question. A priest perpetually, yeah. Is there any um, Hebrew tradition on Melchizedek? Well, certainly they don't think he was the pre-incarnate Christ. Okay. Um, uh, you know, Hebrew tradition would be... Or like a Messiah figure? Did they, do they recognize him as being Messiah-like or not? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, I'm not aware of anything like that. It could be out there. Or there could be some, you know, minority group that believes that or, or held that. Uh, but nothing in any of my studies about Melchizedek um, re, re, lean on or point to any Hebrew tradition about that. Um, 
uh, in any of the ancient commentaries. I'm not aware of it, but good question. All right, well, let's move on. Verse 4 then, Hebrews 7, verse 4. Now, observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. Um, the writer's going to argue here in just a second that Melchizedek was, was greater than any earthly priest because he received a tithe from Abraham the father of those to whom centuries later the law of tithing would be given and centuries later a priesthood would arise, the Levitical priesthood would arise to receive that tithe and all of them were descendants of Abraham but Melchizedek's here collecting it from Abraham before any of that occurred centuries later. Does that make sense? That's the argument that he's making. He's trying to demonstrate that the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is the priestly order that Christ will be high priest, is high priest, is a superior priesthood to the biblical earthly priesthood of the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, the descendants of Levi, the tribe of Levi, Levi uh, of whom Aaron was the first one. We, we say, well, it's the Aaronic priesthood, A-A-R-O-N-I-C, Aaronic, Aaron. The Aaronic priesthood is Aaron's priesthood because he was the first Levi to hold the position. But ultimately, it's the Levitical priesthood that's in view as the earthly priesthood, but Melchizedek's priesthood is otherworldly, it seems. So, or at least that's the argument that the writer of Hebrews is making. So I find this fascinating. He's, he, he's going to basically argue that that the Melchizedekian priesthood is superior to, in one more fashion, to the Levitical priesthood or any earthly priesthood because he showed up on the scene to receive tithes from Abraham before the law ever was codified centuries later through Moses, Abraham's descendant, and through Aaron, Abraham's uh, descendant. Um, I would argue that Melchizedek didn't even need a law to collect the tithe because he was God, the lawgiver. That's why he didn't need a law. He could show up and collect the tithe if he wanted to. And of course, uh, he did. So he collected it without there being a law requiring it. So he's going to make that argument. Um, so he says he gave a tenth of the choice of spo spoils. Verse 4. Now we know it was the spoils of war. Uh, he hears about his nephew Lot's been captured by these uh, by this king, uh, so he goes up against this king, and this king gets five other kings or four others. So there's five kings and their warriors, and Abraham goes in and he kicks their tails, slaughters them all, takes all the booty, takes all the spoils, gets his nephew Lot back and everybody else that was captured, and on his way back from battle. He meets Melchizedek and gives him one tenth of everything he brought back from the from the from the battle. So Abraham's example of giving the choicest of 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 these uh, of this booty uh, of the spoils of war, there 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 is a lesson for us in this. And you know, uh, uh, those of you who've studied with me for many years, you know. Um, I don't like to teach the Old Testament for its moral lessons. I think unless a moral lesson is what's occurring, then the moral lesson should be left to others. I think the scholarship is in what does the text say, what does the text mean, and how do I apply it? Uh, but we've got the text saying that he gave not, spoil, not a tenth of the spoils, but he gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. God is showing us that when he gave, when Abraham gave the tithe, you know, he didn't just say, well, give me, you know, give me some of that, whatever. So, hey, all of you guys give me a tenth. No, no, no. He selected the choicest of the booty, the choicest of the spoils, and that's what he gave to Melchizedek. And I think there's a lesson in that for us. I won't belabor it. Uh, but I think it's, it's worthy of noting that we should never give God our seconds. We should never give God 
of uh, that which we would happily give away uh, or use to pay a bill or, um, uh, you know, or, or something that doesn't cost us anything. Um, you know, Abraham, it cost him something. He had to go to battle. He had to go to war to get his nephew back and to get these spoils. Then he chooses from the best of that to give to God. I think there's a very strong moral uh, argument that's being made there because God includes the phrase or the word choices in the text. He's inspired this text. God's telling us what he wants us to know about these events, and he's, he's pointing it out several times, choices and spoils. So we should be careful that we, when we give to God, we don't give God, you know, our leftovers. We don't give God the things that we don't want or need or care about. Um, you know, whenever, whenever there's a collection of, of toys for children, you know, you don't go through your kid's closet and look for the stuff that the kids aren't playing with. You, you go down to the toy store and you go in there and you lay down some cash, you buy something nice, and you, you know, you, you bless that kid that you're, that you're giving this gift for. You know, that's, that's when your heart's in the right place. And so giving the choices of our spoils, giving us, giving of the choices of what the Lord has given us, giving him our prime time hours, giving him the best of what we've got, um, that's the high ground. That's the one that pleases the Lord. That's the one that uh, gets notice in heaven. Uh, your, your, your heavenly father knows, you might be doing it in secret, but he knows. And if you believe that, A, accolades from the Lord and the pleasure of the Lord is more important to you than the pleasures of men, or, or excuse me, than the accolades of men or pleasing men, um, if you believe that God truly sees everything and knows everything, then those two things alone ought to be enough to motivate us to just give him our best. He knows what we're doing, and it pleases him. And if we believe both of those things, then we ought to be sufficiently motivated to give God our best and not, not give him what's left over. But we give him the first piece of the day, uh, of our wealth, of our time, of our treasure of our talents. Uh, in 2 Samuel 24, 24, King David uh, has just conquered with his army. He has just conquered the Jebusites. They were the people group that lived in the area of what today is Jerusalem. And in particular, there was a guy named Ornan, O-R-N-A-N, Ornan the Jebusite. And he owned a piece of land that was... Uh, about two-thirds of the way up, more or less, up the side of this mountain, and it was a flat area, and it was used as a threshing floor because there was a prevailing wind, and all of those, or many of those from around the area would bring their grain there to be threshed, and when you're threshing grain, you basically take a, a fork or a winnowing fork or something, you throw it in the air, and the, uh, the chaff will float downwind, and the grain will drop not very far away, and so that's how you separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, he wants to he wants to buy it um, from Ornan, and uh, Ornan says, "You've conquered us. You're the king. You won. Just take it. You don't have to buy it." And in Samuel Second Samuel twenty four twenty four, it says, "However, the king said to Ornan, quote, no." but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Now, keep in mind, he's going to use this piece of land to build God's temple. He's going to use this as the temple, uh, as the grounds for the temple, the temple mount, we say. He says, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. Remember, he's going to make a temple there to God. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. That's quite a bit of silver that he paid for this. Here, here he's conquered this area. Imagine, uh, uh, imagine uh, Alexander or Attila the Hun or somebody going in and conquering an area and then choosing a piece of ground, a, a couple of acre ground they want, and offering to pay for it, to buy it from the guy. But David was going to give it to his father, his heavenly father. He was going to give it to God. 
And so he had to pay for it. It had to cost him something or it wasn't, it wasn't a gift from his heart. You know, um, uh, so, you know, so, sometimes we, 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 we re-gift. There's a term for it today, right? Somebody gives us something. I don't have any use for that. I'll spit that aside. I'll give this to somebody later. I'm not saying that's necessarily, you know, uh, you know, not, not your best. Maybe that is the best thing you can do. But when you go out and you, and you, you, acquire something that costs you something and give that away, that certainly is a, a more precious gift than uh, anything you simply took or you received that cost you nothing and you passed it along. That's the concept. So I'm not trying to beat you up. I, I just say, I think the moral lesson is there with these choice, choice of spoils and, and we need to delve into that just a little bit. All right. So verse, uh, let me back up. Let me just read again and get the context flowing here. Verse one, for, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, verse one, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned the tenth of all the spoils, was, first of all, by the translation of the name, king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. Verse 5. And those indeed of the sons of Levi, who received the priest's office, have commandments in the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is from their brethren, although they are descended from Abraham. So let's just break this down. He says, and those indeed of the sons of Levi, the, as I said, the tribe of Levi was chosen by God to be the tribe of Israel's priesthood. You'll find this in uh, Exodus 6, Exodus 28, Leviticus 27, Numbers 18. I, I don't want to read all those passages for you. Uh, but I will read this first one, Exodus 6, 25 and 26. Listen carefully. Aaron, who's the very first priest, the Aaronic priesthood, he, he's the first priest called by God. Aaron's son, Eliezer, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the father's households of the Levites, according to their families. So I'm just establishing that verse. The Levites, according to their families. Verse 26, it was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. So they are, the, it's the same tribe. Aaron, Aaron and Moses are Levites. That's the only point I want to make. Uh, I'll have it in your notes and you can look up the other verses, Leviticus, where the priesthood is established in the tithe and Numbers 18 and so on. You can look all that up. I'll have it in there for you. Uh, but the main point is, is that when Aaron is first chosen to be the first priest, he is a Levite. As it goes on, the Levitical priesthood, while Aaron is still alive, becomes established as the tribe from which God would choose all the priests. In fact, of the 12 tribes, the, the tribe of Levi is the only one that did not get a portion of the land in the promised land. They didn't get a portion. Their portion was going to be the tithe. That's what they were going to live on. All the other tribes were going to pay their tithes to the Levites, and the Levites would be the priests, and they would not have land, and they would not work the land in the agrarian society. Agrarian society. So the tribe of Levi was chosen by Moses to be the tribe of Israel's uh, priesthood. Moses and Aaron also were Levites, as we just looked up. Aaron was the first of the Levitical priests, and the Levites were commanded to collect the tithe. You'll see that in Leviticus 27, Numbers 18. So that's what he's getting at here. He's saying, and those indeed are the sons of Levi, the descendants of Levi, who were the priests of the priesthood, who received the priest's office, <clears throat> have commandments in the law to collect a tenth from the people. So they collect the tithe because it's commanded. It's the law. That is, they collect it from their brothers, their brethren, it says, although they are descended from Abraham, but one whose genealogy is not traced from them that is from the Levites, collected a tenth from Abraham in verse 6 and blessed the one who had the promises. 
are you, are you seeing where his argument is going? He's saying the, the Melchizedekian priesthood is superior because he collected a tithe from Abraham before any of that tithe ever was codified in the law, before the priesthood of the Levites and Aaron and the other Levites was ever even uh, conceived of by human beings. When God called that, uh, when, when, when he called Aaron into the priesthood and established the biblical priesthood, that was centuries later. Melchizedek is collecting it from their progenitor, which is Abraham. That makes Melchizedek's priesthood superior to the Levitical priesthood that the Israelites knew their entire lives, their, their entire existence of their nation almost. So the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Melchizedek was not a descendant of Levi or Abraham. He was not even Jewish. I want you to think about that for a minute. This occurred to me in my studies. I didn't find this in any, any commentaries anywhere. It just occurred to me. The dude's not Jewish. Why? Because he didn't descend from Abraham. Uh, Abraham's descendants are Jews. This guy's a Gentile. If he's a human. How does a Gentile collect a tithe from, uh, from, a, from the first Jew? I don't see it. But if he's the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, makes all the sense in the world. So Melchizedek was not Jewish. Only those descended from Abraham are of the Jewish race. So I'm arguing that once the Son of God came to the earth as a man, Jesus, he then became a Jew. But he was not a Jew when he collected the tithe from Abraham. Because he wasn't Abraham's descendant, at least not yet. When he finally took flesh upon himself, he would. Be. And then finally in the verse, it says, he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Abraham is the one who had the promises. What was the promise? Well, uh, the promise was that I will make you a father of a multitude and uh, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in you. Well, who would argue today that Abraham's descendants, the Jews, have been a blessing to all the nations of the earth? There is so much anti-Semitism. I'm not saying I have a problem with that, but I'm just saying there's so much anti-Semitism around the world. It would be hard to argue that such a small percentage of the world's population has been a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Yet, there was a Jew named Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus bar Joseph, Jesus son of Joseph, the carpenter, through his death, burial, and resurrection has brought into the nation of Israel being grafted in, as Paul explained in Romans, a wild vine being grafted into the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tame vine. He's brought in Millions upon millions upon millions of people from every kindred, tribe, and tongue uh, into, the, into the family of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's how that covenant that God offered Abraham was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in his descendant, his great, 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 great grandson, Jesus of Nazareth. So when the promises were made to Abraham, they were made to Abraham and that descendant of his that would eventually come. And I'll just read for you Galatians 3.16, one of my favorite verses. Listen carefully. New Testament now, Paul writing, explaining the Old Testament. He says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, quote, and to seeds, plural, close quote, as referring to many but rather to one, quote, and to your seed, close quote, that is Christ. Now, that's what Paul said one more time. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, as referred to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. So when he, it's, it's so interesting when he says, the one whose genealogy is not traced from them, meaning, meaning Melchizedek, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises, he blessed the one who had the promise along with the one who was giving him the blessing. Do you see that irony there? That the promises were made to Abraham and to the Christ. 
And here you have the pre-incarnate Christ giving the blessing to the one who had the promise. That's powerful stuff. Verse 7, we'll end with verse 7. I might do verse 8. Yeah, we'll do verse 8. Now nah, we'll stop at verse 7. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Verse 7. Who's the lesser? Abraham. Who's the greater? Melchizedek. Well, if Melchizedek is just a man, how's he any greater than Abraham? He's not. The only way he gets to be greater than Abraham, if he is superior to Abraham in some way, and that's because he is the pre-incarnate Christ. Abraham the lesser is blessed by Melchizedek the greater. Abraham is the father of the Hebrew nation, God's chosen people. Think about that. How can he be the lesser if Melchizedek is just an ordinary man and not even of God's chosen people? Well, Abraham is the lesser because Melchizedek is the pre -incarnate. That's it. That's the only way it works that I can see in the text. All right, so we'll close the study there. We got about 10 minutes left because we started right at five after. So we'll take questions. Anybody has any questions? This would be uh, the time to speak up. Feel free to unmute and, and uh, show your face if you want to. And uh, anybody have a question about the study or anything else? Open Mic Monday. Talk about anything you want. If you don't have anything, it's okay. You don't have to come up with something. No, it's not a question about the study, but you did ask me to remind you tonight for us to discuss about 4th of July. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, next uh, month, 4th of July falls on a Monday. Now that we've sold the condo and <laughs> won't be up at the lake uh, trying to stretch a three-day weekend into a four-day weekend, I'll be around and I'm happy to teach. Um, do you guys have a thought as to whether you're going to be in town or around or want to be uh, doing Bible study on July 4th that evening or, or whether you would just like to take that off? I think July 4th is a Sunday. Uh, is that right? Uh-huh. Monday must be the, the holiday, though. It's, yeah, Monday's the day that it's observed. Sorry, yeah, that's the, what I yeah. meant. Monday is okay. the holiday. The official holiday. Banks are closed. and the market's closed, and our offices will be closed. And you'll be over at our house eating, I hope, or us at your all's one or two. That was my son-in-law, Daniel, talking. But yeah, that's, that's a good point, Dan. Thank you for that. So uh, do you guys want to gather or do you want to take the night off? If nobody cares, I'm going to go ahead and teach. But if you're going to be fiddling around with family and stuff and, and it's just going to, you know, grip your style, no problem. All right, there being no motion and no second. Uh, I motion for teaching. The pro proposal. To, oh, there is a motion. Is there a second? There is no second. There is a second. There is a second. All right. Densler uh, has made a motion and three thirds has made a second. Is there a vote? All in favor of um, studying together on that Monday, the 5th of July? Wiggle your monitor or say aye. 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 All opposed? There being none, the motion carries. All right, so we will gather on that on that night. A um, couple more minutes. Anybody got anything else? If not, is there anybody got a, a pressing prayer matter we can pray about? And I won't put you on the spot. To, I'll pray. You won't have to pray if you want to share something. I would like to share that, um, you know, I sent that application out and I got confirmation that they received it. And so just that. Tell everybody that, what you mean, honey. Um, I sent an application out to the uh, 
College of Biblical Studies for an adjunct position there. So I would just like prayer for um, that my application wouldn't fall through the cracks, that I would be seen, that I would um, be, uh, I guess, guided through that process and right. that I wouldn't have worries while waiting on those things because they can take forever and ever. Right. Okay, we will pray about that. Anybody else? Any anything pressing down on you right now? Anything? Any burden you're carrying? Yes, a Friday deadline for a very important project. Yes, that's what we were praying about earlier, you and me, the other day. Your thesis? You talking about your thesis? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll pray about that. Uh, anyone else? Jeff, how's your head? A little bit better. Well, we'll pray for Jeff. <laughs> What's that? So I think it moved down into my neck. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for our study time tonight, Lord. Um, I know I, I, I take a position and there, there's debate uh, among scholars on that. And I just pray that you got all, all of us in the truth, that we would hold our truths loosely until you correct us and that we hear your correction when, when it comes. Uh, our goal is not to be right, it's to know the truth. Uh, we don't want to be arrogant, we want to be humble. We don't want to be teachers and students of your word. That's so more, much more important to us. We want, to, we want to take the Mary position and not the Martha position. We want to be at your feet. We want to be learning from you, receiving your blessings, Lord. Thank you for the time. Uh, Father, we pray for Chelsea. First, that you'd give her peace in her mind and heart, Lord. Uh, you know the plans you have. You know what you've laid out for her. You know the path that you, that you want her to go. You already know how you're going to bless her, what you're going to give her, and what you're going to withhold, you know. So give her peace and give her contentment. Um, in the meantime, Father, we pray that, uh, that, that her best foot would, would be forward, that, uh, that the college would uh, consider her application prayerfully. They would hear your voice speaking to them. They would recognize her tremendous value. Uh, what a student uh, of scripture she is, uh, what, a, what a talented gift of teacher she is as you've created her and as you've molded and shaped her throughout her life and her academic career, that they would see all of that. And, and, if, and if there is a place for, for her uh, that pleases you, Father, I pray that you would, you would place her there. It's her heart's desire. Uh, if that's not for her, Father, then, then direct her to what uh, you do want to do for her and how you do want to bless her uh, uh, according to all the study and all the preparation that you brought her through. We trust that to you. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, Shalena, also an academic issue. She's facing a thesis and uh, whew, studying and preparing and reading and taking the notes now and writing and getting and rewriting and editing and getting it just so. Father, I pray that you've got her with every every phrase, every sentence, every paragraph, uh, that you would help her get that project completed, completed on time, that it would be her very best work, and that she would receive the grade appropriate to her best work, Father. Uh, we trust that to you. We pray, Lord, for all of her studies and all the courses that she still has in front of her that you would help her to pace herself, not go too fast or too slow, that you would provide the resources, financial and otherwise, that she needs to complete her training. And Father, at the end of her training, we pray that you would bless her with the career that she desires in her heart, with that, with that perfect job where she can contribute and be fulfilled and go home every night knowing she did your will, that she blessed others, uh, and that she's filled up because of it. Father, we pray for Jeffrey. We love this man. Uh, he's, a, he's a gentle giant in my eyes, Father. I admire him. Uh, I wish I was more like him. I thank you that he's in my life, and that a little bit of him rubs off on me from time to time. 
I pray you'd heal him, Father, of this uh, headache and this neck, neck thing he's got, whatever's going on, stress, uh, burdens of, of, of being a dad, and, uh, a, a yet again, a new dad, and uh, all those crazy rugrats of his, and his wife, what a blessing she is. He's got to care for her and provide for her and them, and uh, he runs the business and carries the load there, and uh, I just pray, Father, that you'd give him relief, lift his burdens, ease, ease the, the discomfort in his head and his neck, uh, let him lay his head down tonight uh, in peace and, uh, and get a good night's rest and wake him refreshed in the morning ready for the day. Father, there were other items I'm sure that were in our hearts that we maybe were about to voice and just didn't. I lift those up to you too, Lord, and pray that, that you would meet that need, that you would provide for that thing, that you would resolve that conflict. Uh, that you would take away that burden, that you would give strength and encouragement where it's needed, uh, so that all of us, Father, might walk and live by faith in you. In your son's name, amen.